Good. So, looking at, uh, and if you've been with us for a while in a series, looking at uh, John 14 to 17, uh, these are Jesus' farewell words to his disciples. He's, he's not the crucifixion uh, and then the resurrection weeks away from when he's going to ascend to heaven and he's leaving his disciples and all this teaching is about life when he's teaching he's preparing his disciples for that next period when he's going to be gone physically and we are now in that period and what Jesus was teaching his disciples 2,000 years ago includes us. It's for us. We are in that same time period. And the instruction that he gave 2,000 years ago applies to us now. A couple weeks ago, um, especially when we talked about the coming of the Spirit, which is in the text that, that we just read, uh, I talked about not alone. Uh, and one of the things I suggested in, in that sermon is that uh, maybe during that week you might write a little note to someone, just, you know, you are not alone, just to remind people. And I'm just wondering if any of you maybe received that reminder and, uh, you know, maybe you want to share what, how that might, might have been important to you at that moment to be reminded you are not alone. Okay. <laughs> it came at the perfect moment as I was working on some stuff for ministry and mm. I was I was struggling mm. and I was feeling a bit alone. Mm. And so that was mm. an encouragement mm. that at least more more just <laughs> Well, because of the timing, it must have been God, because that really relates to what we'll talk about today. You know, that's, you know, I was just thinking of people and writing a note, you know, and, and in my maybe not even consciously thinking of God, God was doing something. So anyone else just have anything to share about that, receiving or sending that note to someone? You're, you're looking like you want to share, maybe not. I'm better than you Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I, I was also uh, received uh, from you, and that was reminding for me to, to send mm. others. Mm. So I posted on Instagram some pictures uh, mm. for mine, and yeah, uh, with the same message. Mm. Or just, just maybe try that again this week. Just pick one or two people. I mean, even look around now. Think of someone you might send that to. Think of someone who maybe is not likely to receive that message. You know, there's some of you who never really speak to people. You're an introvert like I am, but your, your job doesn't require you to, you know, speak like I have to. And so there might be some people who don't often get a message from someone, and maybe this week, just write that to them. You're not alone. You know, reminding them that God is with them, and for, of course, the fact that you write that as a reminder that you thought of them as well. <clears throat> so this is a text that John read uh, from John uh, uh, chapter 16, and it very much um, follows logically what we talked about last week, about the importance of bearing fruit, uh, and that that's why God has chosen us in order to bear fruit. Uh, but he says, now I'm going to him who sent me. That's been an emphasis in the Gospel of John. Jesus was sent. He was sent from the Father. It's really the main thing that this Gospel tells us about Jesus. He was sent from the Father. Because the Father has a plan. And Jesus was sent working out that plan. And the Holy Spirit is going to be sent according to that plan. And we're going to be sent according to that plan. And we're all part of that plan, just like Jesus was part of that Plan. We, too, are going to be sent ones. And now they're a little bit sad. I mean, they've, they've heard words from Jesus about what's going to come. They don't quite get it. You know, this crucifixion, they don't, you know, they're not really processing that too well, but they realize something a little bit scary is coming up. And so they're somewhat filled with grief about these things. But then Jesus says, look, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's hard to believe because I think a lot of us, if we have um, 
been in church or maybe walked with Jesus, we've, we've had the thought, I, if I could just really see Jesus face to face, you know, wouldn't that be incredible? How, how fortunate those disciples were that they got to see Jesus face to face. They were privileged and we're missing out something because we don't see Jesus face to face physically. Jesus says that's actually not correct thinking. It's going to be to their advantage that he's going to go. If I go, the counselor, we'll come back to that word, won't come to you. But if I go, and when he comes, he's going to have this ministry, and we're going to begin to look at the details of this passage. I to translate um, the term that's used for the Holy Spirit, translation I've copied from is uses the word Some translations use the word helper or counselor. You know, but, you know, how accurate that is depends on what a person means by counselor. The, the word itself comes from two shorter words, and it has the idea of someone who is called alongside you. So it was sometimes used in a legal sense. That's why some translations use the word advocate. It's like a lawyer. And if you have to defend yourself or explain yourself, you might hire someone, a professional, you know, who will look guide you and speak for you. And that's a counselor. I, I, uh, from, from years ago, I, I, many, many years ago, before I came to Latvia, I, I worked at a Christian camp in the summers. Uh, and I, I, so that's kind of an unknown fact of, about me that I'm, you know, if my, you know, if I would have a bunch of horses and dogs, you know, and occasionally people would wander into my existence. Um, uh, one day in the new heavens and the new earth, but 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 not yet. But I, I remember these kids would come. Nine to fourteen was the age of the kids coming to ride about scanning a picture. I have a picture of me pre-beard, but it's like no one has seen pictures of me pre-beard, and so I thought I won't won't do that. But they had five horses, and they would be. Tied to this long rail, so the horse is on one side of the rail, and then the kids were over there, and then when they were told to, the kids would come and choose which horse they were going to ride. Um, so they'd choose the horse, and then they'd be told to, to get on the horse, and they'd go underneath the rail, get on the left, climb on the horse. Um, but of course, there's sometimes these little nine-year-old girls trying to get on a really, really big horse, and you know, they're trying to lift their foot up and they, they literally just couldn't, you know, some little kids would just try and they would, I mean, they'd literally be like this trying to pull themselves up. They just couldn't do it. Um, but, so it was, you know, someone to literally pick them up and put them on. Now, I, I don't, this next part of this little illustration, I don't mean to be sexist here. I have, you know, a very high view of women and their role in Christian work and leadership and so forth. But because often the, the, the female workers with the kids, they didn't want to get too close to the horse. Because, you know, the horses are standing there all day. And, you know, during the course of the day, there's physical needs that horses have. And they just let loose, you know, right there. And so underneath, you know, it's not, you know, it's not like this. And, of course, some of these female workers were wearing sandals. And they didn't want, you know, stuff squishing between their toes and so forth. And so they would stand on the rail and try to encourage these little girls to get on the horse. You can do it, sweetie. You can do it. Just, just, you can do it. You know, but they're standing over here and it didn't work. Okay, what the kid needed was someone to come alongside of them, literally, physically, okay, and at least get them started on the process. Okay, someone alongside of them. And Jesus is simply saying, this is what the Holy Spirit is there for. He's going to be close, alongside of you, helping you, um, helping you to live your life, helping you to fulfill your mission. Okay, and again, we're going to come, come back to that. The fruit that is so important, that is necessary, like we talked about last week, it's necessary for our lives to bear fruit. But the good news is, we're not the ones who have to make that happen. Okay, we actually have God beside us. 
God who's going to make our life possible, not, not the life that we choose for ourselves, but the good life, the good plan of a good God that, that he's designed for you, it's going to be possible because he's going to become close, be close, be beside you, and your life will be possible and fruit will be possible okay, because he's going to send his spirit, his counselor, to make your best life, which is God's best life for you, possible. It will be possible. <clears throat> Here Jesus, um, later on, is going to call him the spirit of truth in verse 12 and 13. Uh, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So very, very quickly, I'm going to kind of go off passage, and this will be my own little private rant. Okay, that isn't exactly um, the point that Jesus was making. But I, I just, I keep reflecting on the contemporary world, uh, how much truth is devalued now. Uh, I, I talk about it all the time. You know, can, is there any source of truth? Is there, I, I, I've said this before, I trust when it comes to news. I, don't, I cannot think of a single news source It comes on, on like Facebook and so forth, and I have lots of sorts of stuff, and there's only a, a small handful, I think, of, of people that whatever they post, I, I assume this is probably trustworthy. Because we all messages and repeat messages that we don't verify. God, who speaks the truth, are not sufficiently valuing truth. If we don't take truth seriously, if we don't remain well informed, it's going to be easier for people to believe lies. And this is especially important for your kids. They need to see you valuing truth. Because if you don't, you're basically encouraging them to believe lies. And then who knows what kind of lies they will believe later on down the road. We need to be people of truth, that are careful with truth, that speak less and don't speak until we know what we're talking about. Okay, so end of little rant. I had a longer rant to give. I'll just end it there. But I, I've something to just keep making this point of how we're we're forming people spiritually. It's part of spiritual formation. But what we're forming people to do is to not value truth. Uh, uh, being, um, you know, someone who's making a point that I completely agree with is an important point. You know, but just kind of said, there's this story about this person. You know, okay, now maybe that story isn't true. But still, it, it's like, no, you can't do that. If it's not the story, if it's not a true story, if you don't know it's true, then you can't value it as evidence for your point. We just can't do that. Not anymore. Not anymore for the sake of the kingdom of God. Oh, Jesus says, this is to your advantage that I'm going to go away. Because if I go, then I'm going to send the spirit, the spirit that has been in me. Now I'm sending to you, to my people. And this is going to be the unfolding of God's Plan. It's going to be a step forward in the Father's plan. That it's advancing God's plan. Even if we think, wow, I just wish I could have Jesus physically with me, what's going to advance the plan, the Father's plan, is that Jesus goes to the Father and sends his spirit to us. So this is the main point of the message today about part of the role of the Spirit here, and what the Spirit is going to do for us is going to make our influence possible. It's going to make fruit possible. What might have seemed impossible last week, can we actually bear fruit? Can we actually make a difference? It is possible. Because the Father's going to send the Spirit. Because it's the Father's plan. Why wouldn't he make it possible? Why well, it makes sense that God would have this great plan, but it's an impossible plan and it can't happen anyway. 
That doesn't make sense. It's the father's plan. It's the father's work. The father's working toward results. And it makes perfect sense that he's going to give the resources necessary for it to happen. That resource is the spirit. So he says, when he comes, the spirit, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the Spirit is alongside of us, helping us, speaking to us, defending us. But the Spirit is also alongside of us as part of the communication process. I mean, in, in chapter 15, when the Counselor comes... Whom I Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes out from goes out from the Father, He will testify about me. And you are for you have been with me from the beginning. The Spirit beside us will testify. Of course, He will testify only as we are testifying. Okay? As we testify, then the Spirit testifies. It doesn't seem to be the norm. I mean, God can do as he wants, and he does do things in his own way. But the norm is, when God is doing his work, he does it through his people. The Spirit will testify as long as we're testifying. If we're silent, then maybe the Spirit is silent in that situation. Maybe not. The Spirit is God. He can do as he pleases. But Jesus is saying, he will testify, but you've got to testify. Because the Spirit is beside us as we testify. The Spirit is doing his work of convicting. He's convicting of sin. Um, so here he says, he'll convict about sin because people do not believe in me. What does that mean? Well, this is the ultimate fatal sin. Not trusting in God. Look, you know, from Genesis chapter 3 till the end of the, the Bible, where there's, in a sense, the Bible is full of sin. God knows about our sin, okay? The sin doesn't surprise him. But the good news is the sin problem has been taken care of. When Jesus died, he died for all sins, for all people, all people for Sin has been removed as a barrier. Sin has been removed as a barrier. There is no between any human and God. But that relationship with God, because the point isn't to get rid of sin. The point is to come to God. What God wants is a relationship. The sin has to be removed, because the sin is a barrier. But the sin has been removed, and Jesus Christ has been removed. So the door is open to God, but you have to come to God. That's what it's about, to know God. In John chapter 17, Jesus is going to say, This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with God. That sin has to be removed, but what is necessary then is for people to actually come to God. God. So the sin has been removed. But Jesus said in John chapter 8, sins. And for love, I say I am, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to die. You don't actually come, believe, trust, not just believe facts, but trust in who Jesus is. So he's going to convict the world about that, not just that they are sinners, but that what they need is to come to God. And he's going to convict the world about righteousness. Again, what, what does that mean? What, is, you know, what does it mean for the world to be convicted about righteousness? Well, Jesus explains, because I'm where you can see me no longer. So what, is, what the... Holy Spirit is going to convict people about is who Jesus is. He is the righteous one. Jesus going to the Father is the assurance that indeed Jesus is the righteous one. He is who he said he is. The fact that he was on the cross doesn't mean he was unrighteous. 
he wasn't truly guilty, but his being taken to heaven is a sign that he was in fact righteousness. And that looks like Jesus is who he said he is. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict about that. <clears throat> And then he's going to convict about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Satan, the accuser, the ruler, the prince of this world, temporarily, he's going to be condemned. And if he is going to be condemned, if he cannot escape judgment, then no one else is going to be able to escape judgment. God's judgment is sure. No one can escape. The most powerful enemy of God will not escape. He will be judged. He will be judged. Evil will be judged. That's actually good news. You know, it's good news. It will be judged. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict of that. That in fact there is a judgment and we need to take that seriously. So this is part of the role of the Spirit. He's going to testify as we testify to the truth with our own often weak, feeble words. He will be beside us testifying, giving power and energy to our words. And so this is kind of the, the main thing I want us to get as we even move to the next part of the passage is is for us to learn to live with a little more confidence. I mean, some people naturally have a lot of confidence. Um, I'm not one of those persons. I don't live with a lot of confidence. I can pretend like I have a lot of confidence. And so some people think I am, but I'm, I'm not actually that kind of person. Um, we can live our life and we can speak with confidence that every to the truth, our words can make a difference. And the good news is that because he is active, we don't have to make things happen. We don't actually, we don't have to win an argument, for instance, because it's not really our argument. We, we testify to the truth. We, we don't have to be a jerk about the gospel, okay? You know? We, we don't have to be. As if, apart from our into people's minds, they're never going to get the truth. It's going to penetrate people's brains and hearts. That never really happens, you know, our words and raising our voice. Does that work? Has that ever worked? If you talk a little bit louder, if you write in all caps, oh, wow, now suddenly these words are going to have, it. we know it doesn't work that way. We don't have to be a pest. Just testify to the truth with confidence knowing that the Spirit is doing His work. I, I think about an earlier uh, parable of Jesus in, in the other Gospels, his, his parable about, um, uh, you know, the, the, the landowner is going on a trip and he leaves different sums of money with his servants and they're supposed to do something with it. Um, and, you know, if you remember that parable, some really invested, get a big return. One guy doesn't. He buries it in the ground, and all he gives back to the landowner is the same amount. You know, and one of the points of the parable is that, you know, the, the landowner was looking for a return. You know, he, he reaps where he did not sow. And part of what that parable about is about is just the importance of investing. Because the landowner... He's trying to get a return. God, it's about his kingdom. And he want his, wants his kingdom to grow. It's his plan. He wants things to happen. And that's why we can be confident. Because he wants it to happen. Okay? He wants it. He wants it more than we do. And so we don't have to worry and make it happen. Because it's, it's God's thing. We just testify to the truth. A lot of fruit... Um, and that, you know, in, in the parable, the first part of John 15 about the vine and the branches, and branches that don't bear fruit, at some point, they're cut off and burned. That's how important fruit is. God is expecting fruit. Um, but the, the reality is, is that we as humans are probably not in a place to judge what that fruit looks like or where it comes. Okay? 
So, you know, last talking about fruit, there needs to be fruit. I was not, I definitely was not looking at anyone making that judgment. I cannot make a judgment about fruit or how long it's going to take to come because, I mean, um, I mean, I think John heard that about early Latvian history and some Moravian missionaries came here a little over 200 years ago and it took about nine years before there was finally some, you know, what, what would look like spiritual fruit. Of course, some people go to other parts of the world and they labor for a life not till the next generation. So fruit might take a long time. Okay, so we as humans might not be able to judge what that looks like. Um, but we can, if we're living our life with Jesus for fruit, we can be confident that whether we see it right away or not, that God is working and that there will be fruit. So this is part of what the advocate is doing for us. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say to you, you can't handle it now. I mean, if there was ever a true statement for any of us, you know, there's more truth than we can handle right now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me. One of the important statements to remember about the Spirit. He will glorify me, Jesus. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. That's what he's there for, to exalt Jesus. Because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So the Spirit is speaking not his own words or about himself, but he's reminding them of the words of Jesus, like we talked about last week, the teaching of Jesus, the mission of Jesus. And he's there to glorify not himself, but Jesus the Son. And as Jesus the Son is lifted up, then he will draw people, and the Spirit's mission will be accomplished as Jesus is lifted up. So here's the thing, as we live our life in a world that is full of trouble, uh, next week actually John is going to look at a text at the end of John chapter 15 more about the world and you know maybe some more about the trouble that is in the world. We live in a world that's full of trouble. We're conscious of our own weaknesses. We're conscious, I hope, of our own sins. But we have not arrived yet. And so it would be very easy to live right now in a very sort of discouraged way, sort of in survival mode. You know, I just, I just got to try to survive. If I can just kind of hide away and get in my shelter, hopefully my faith will survive and I will make it through this age and come out at the other end if I just play it safe. Believe me, I'm of all the people to play it safe. I'm about the most low-risk person I know. I'm, I'm not joking. It'd be very easy to live our lives that way. Very easy for me to just, you know, keep things as simple as possible and just protect myself. I want to say that if the Spirit is with us, we can live more boldly than we do. We, we don't have to be weird about it necessarily. There's someone that... that, that um, Monica knows she's an older person with the Salvation Army. She's an amazing person. I, you know, I couldn't do what she, she, she does, but she'll, you know, she'll be on a bus. I mean, I've heard her testimonies about this and feel like God is telling her to stand up on a bus and evangelize people. Okay, so, so she'll do it. If she feels like the Spirit is telling her to do it, she'll do it. I don't, I don't kind of expect to. I don't know of any visible fruit that comes from that. You know, so I'm not saying it has to look like that, okay? Because I, I, I doubt it will look like that for most of us. But we can live with a little more confidence, with trust. We can live a little more boldly, worrying a little bit less about certain details of our life. 
Um, I've said before, for those of you who've been around, I come from a, a, a weird kind of family. My, my brothers are pastors. My sister's married to a pastor. I have cousins who are pastors or church planners. I have nieces and nephews who are, most of them are not kind of in professional Christian work, but they're doing sort of a, amazing things missionally. And so sometimes we get on these long email discussions, and so we're just this last slowly fizzled out that I looked like it had 50 or more entries in my family, and some of them were, were pretty long, so I wrote a couple long ones. But, but it kind of started with, with one of my brothers who's, um, um, he's, he's probably the most sensitive of us, and I'm minded, uh, but he's also, he's, he's the, middle, the middle child, the middle son, and so often that comes with its own sort of psychological thing. So, lived with some degree uh, of depression, but he's very sensitive about his life and wanting his life to make a difference. And, and one of the things he struggles with is that um, um, uh, where they live is in, in a, a, a city in North Carolina that has like the world's highest concentration of PhDs in science and engineering. A lot of professors of the church, you know, where most of the people are professors incomes. His wife is a chemistry professor at a big university. She's a, an award-winning professor. So her income is decent. But he's very uncomfortable with living in a nice house. And he's very uncomfortable with pastoring a church where people have a good bit of money. And so he's just constantly asking, is this all there is? So he doesn't have joy because he's always thinking there's... My and this house does it. What does it have to do with them? This car and this. And so he's, he's often living that, you know, just, you know, thinking it, it, it's kind of useless, meaningless. Why do we have this stuff? You know, it, it discourages his wife because, you know, they're building a house and his wife is excited about it. And he's like, eh, well, I guess. Um, but, but this is what I to my brother because I, I don't think he needs to live that way. He needs to trust the Spirit with, the, with his particular questions. That if the Spirit is beside him, if the Spirit wants him to sell his house, then the Spirit is fully capable of communicating that to him. If the Spirit wants him to resign from his church and take a poor church, then the Spirit can tell him to do that. Okay. Now, that saying whatever you're doing just don't think about it and just you know no I, I'm saying that about someone who is trying to be sensitive to the spirit is trying to live to the kingdom of God and I, like I said he's got like the most sensitive heart imaginable so he's wanting to do the right thing and I, just stop worrying about that so much just live joyfully Enjoy your house and your car, any of the things that you enjoy, just enjoy it. You know, serve God where he has called you. If, if God wants you to make a change, he's God. He can communicate that, okay? He can. So again, if you are, if you are sincerely wanting to live your life for God, then just live your life, you know, being aware that the Spirit might speak and being ready to change. He might call for a big change. He might not. But enjoy the life you have been given with confidence that the Spirit is beside you and He can speak to you. You don't have to live joylessly. In the book of Acts, it's been a while since I counted, but I think book of Acts, it's full of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Spirit comes on His church in Acts chapter 2. It's about the work of the Spirit. I think it's something like 40 times in the book of Acts that talks about joy and rejoicing. Okay? We can live with confidence. And we can speak with confidence. Yeah, not necessarily having bizarre conversations. Just in the midst of having normal conversations with people, live as if Jesus matters to you. And if he matters times that you can speak his name, you don't have to necessarily make it happen, you know, but just live with people, engage with people, converse with people, live 
your life. You don't have to argue. You don't have to make things happen because the Spirit is with you. Testify when you can, and He will testify. A couple weeks ago then, um, there was a sermon about making a difference. And we can make a difference. I, I, I've said all along that this teaching that Jesus gives is it's the same thing over and over. It's not like a lot of different things that Jesus says here. He's giving us one complete picture of what our life is like in this age. And we can make a difference. So you are not alone. You're not alone. Again, just to reemphasize for many of you, you know, who are not at home here in Latvia, necessarily. You're not alone. And when you move on from here, you're not alone. You will never be alone. There's no place in the world where God is not. You, you can't get away with him, from him. If you tried, you just can't. Okay, you're not alone. You cannot possibly be alone. There's no part of the universe where he is not Lord. Okay? If he can judge Satan, then he's Lord. He's the overlord of even Satan's world. It's his world. You're not alone. And you can make a difference. You can make a difference. However weak you might see yourself to be, you can make a difference. You might have lived most of your life thinking, no one has ever listened to me. I mean, I was the youngest in my family, so when I was a kid, that was my view of myself. No one will ever listen to me. No one does listen to me. I think probably one of the things that drove me, not necessarily in a healthy way, was, you know, I, I wanted to be heard. I wanted to make a difference. And that's not always, you know, a healthy motivation. Um, but that's, I, I spent much of my life seeing myself that way. I'm not important. No one cares. No one is listening to me. You know, my older sister, she's an amazing speaker and musician. And my oldest brother is just an amazing preacher. I mean, he really is, you know. And I could just easily think, man, I just, I don't measure up. I just need to shut my mouth. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. It's certain you can make a difference because the Holy Spirit is beside you. It's certain you can. It's certain that you can. He's beside you and it's, he's doing the Father's work. And he's going to do it because it's the Father's work. He's going to do the work. The work will be done, and you can be a part of it. And this is part of the good news. Yeah, it's a responsibility. We must testify. But as we testify, the Spirit is behind, beside us testifying. And you're wherever you go. Let's pray.